So, good afternoon, everyone. So, we come to the conclusion of a very nice uh, conference. So, we are actually going to present an instruction course on the cataract surgery practice management. Uh, building a successful cataract surgery uh, practice is something different from learning a cataract surgery. We have been taught, we have a lot of uh, training institutes which teaches us cataract surgery. But uh, it's quite actually rare to see a place where they talk about the cataract surgery practice. For example, uh, you must have completed your cataract surgery training, but once you come out, which microscope to buy? Do we really need a biometer? Which biometer to go for it? How to get a training for a biometer? It's all a gray area. So basically our instruction course is going to focus on uh, how to build up a cataract surgery, right from buying which equipment, then uh, how are we going to invest in it? And then uh, even more important is in case uh, if a patient is not satisfied with the outcome, how are we going to deal with them? Because it's them who are going to bring the patient or who are going to uh, make our practice uh, low. So we have uh, five eminent speakers here. Uh, I mean like uh, sharing with me will be Dr. Ratik Sheikh, who is a academic research committee chairman of uh, Tamil Nadu Ophthalmic Association. Dr. Pradeepa, uh, the clinical director of uh, MNI Hospital Chennai. Dr. Nivian, uh, academic director of uh, MNI Hospital Chennai. Dr. Tamilarasi, senior consultant from uh, the Eye Foundation. So the first talk will be by me. Uh, all right, so I'm going to talk on optical biometers. Um, okay, so the ultrasound technology has been used in ophthalmology since uh, 1960s. Uh, when the IOL began to gain popularity later in 70s, the ultrasound A scan uh, to measure the axial length of the eye became more popular and more advanced. The A scan became more accurate over time with the addition of the gates to it. So the A-scan biometry became more accurate over time with the addition of the gates to take into account the changes in the velocity of a sound as it travels to the different media in the eye. So by 1919s, the ultrasound measurement of the axial length was accurate to approximately 0.1 mm, uh, which is much, much more reliable and de facto gold standard for the calculation of IL power in cataract surgery. In late 1990s, an alternate to this ultrasound biometer was introduced, which is optical biometry based on the principle of partial coherence interferometry. With the increased accuracy, that is up to 0 0.05 mm, the optical biometry has arguably become the gold standard for excellent measurement in ophthalmology over the past 10 years. Right. So we'll just see what an ultrasound and a what an bi optical biometer gives us. Uh, basically, ultrasound measures the anatomical axial length but an optical bi biometry measures the optical axial length. So uh, even a small millimeters of difference will definitely be uh, importance because we are in an era of refractive cataract surgery. So an eye with an axial length that is greater than 26, the anatomical axial length is in a, on a mean 0.8 millimeter longer than the optical axial length. Remember the anatomical axial length is what is being recorded by the ultrasound and optical is what being recorded by the optical. Excuse me. Okay. So the an error of one millimeter in the axial and measurement will yield to your refractive surprise of approximately 2.8 diopters. So we are justified in going with the newer technology of measuring the optical axial length. And then next is that ultrasound measures the axial length up to the internal limiting membrane. That's the innermost layer of the retina. But an optical biometer measures up to the Bruch membrane. Uh, what happens in ultrasound is that it measures till the internal limiting membrane and it actually uh, calculates, uh, it has got a constant of 200 microns. The older formulas will actually incorporate this constant and measure the axial length and consequently the IOL power. But 
remember the retina could be anywhere between 140 to 450 microns so there could also be an error which can be induced here so to overcome this the optical biometer measures the axial length up to bruch membrane so it is the original axial length of that patient okay so the next is the way it measures the ultrasound measures using a sound which is actually the longer wavelength optical biometer uses a light which is a shorter wavelength so always whenever the wavelength is longer there is always a chance that there could be a noise a high noise ratio which can lead to an error but so the point uh, the take home point would be shorter the wavelength the better would be the acquisition so in that way also the optical biometer is going to be the preferred ones right so measurement mode properly done immersion a scan so remember the point properly done particularly done by a highly experienced person so we need a highly experienced person person to take the measurement and validate the measurement uh, but in case of an optical biometer it has got an inbuilt validation system so anybody even an untrained optometrist can actually do it and even after taking it just with the print out he can validate the measurement it has got lot of validation criteria so just by looking into the print out you can validate but not in case of an ultrasound so an ultrasound once you take the print out you never have a idea what how it was done a simple example is that when the measurement was taken in an immersion mode instead of a contact mode the error could be highly wrong so the observer who is taking it is going to be uh, has to be a highly experienced person right so denser cataracts most of the time we used to say that denser cataracts are difficult with an optical biometer and that's where the ultrasound actually gains so remember with the high increased gain is what the ultrasound is going to measure the axial length by increasing the gain sometimes the measurement of axial length can be slightly uh, erroneous also with the advanced technology of optical biometer especially with the swept source oct uh, the optical biometer is able to get values in 95% of the eyes in rarely when you have a dense block of pcc it may be difficult but if the patient is able to see the light definitely the measurement is going to be as accurate to make it simple if an optical biometer takes a value in a denser cataract it will be on dot if it is not taking you may need to go for an immersion but an immersion you may not be very sure whether the taken axial length is going to be perfect or not so the parameter measured primarily immersion takes only the axial length with the introduction of the gates we were able to take the acd and the lens thickness but this cannot be extrapolated and used in any of the newer generation formulas but the optical gives you the axial length acd the central corneal thickness the k it, it includes a posterior k true k lens thickness y to y everything so use of modern generation formulas is very easy using an optical biometer you don't need to go back to your system and then enter all these values to get a value right so when you have all the measurements in one source uh it is always better and it reduces the transcription errors for example in an ultrasound you have to take the k reading from other machine and then input when you are when you are inputting if the value is going to be wrong your whole calculation is going to be wrong so this translate as the increased precision for the optical biometer and improvement in this accuracy of oral calculation so as of now we could say that axial length is no longer the limiting factor for the calculation so what we need to think is that it is hard to conceive of now how precision of axial length measurement can be increased much further beyond what is possible in an optical biometry the result of this is increased precision have been improved in the accuracy of oral calculation all these years in fact biometry was so much improved it is no longer the limiting factor in the oral power calculation so the sources of error is going to be the keratometry remember different keratometers take different reading at different areas of cornea now you have an ultrasound when you take it from different values different machines you never know which is going to be uh, giving you the right value for in your immersion but every optical has its own keratometer and it has been customized for that keratometry so the error of transcription and error of acquisition is much lesser with an optical biometer a manual keratometer takes a 3.2 and iel master takes a 2.5 a lens star at 2.1.7 to 2.2 anti run takes a 2.46 mm for example you are a harder cataract you are trying with an optical biometer you have an iol master you cannot use that k value to input into an ultrasound when it is an ultrasound it has to be a manual keratometer or at the max an auto refractor keratometer so uh, this is mainly attributed to the different technology different measurement zones and diffractive refractive index so remember always make sure your 
the acquisition of keratometry is good to get the good value when you're using an Im uh, immersion A scan. And when you're using a keratometry, always make sure when you're buying a new brand or something, always make sure the refract index used in the keratometer is good. If the keratometer used is not customized for the refract index what you're using, then you may get an error. So all these are actually negated with the optical biometer. You don't need to look at the refract index. You don't need to look at what zone it is taking. It has all been customized for that particular machine. So as I said, uh, immersion relies on the manual keratometer, but all the opticals has their own inbuilt keratometry. This is very, very important when it comes to the post-refractive surgery eyes. So post-refractive surgery eyes, when you take a pentacam, you cannot input the keratometry values into an immersion. You need to go online then do it. But in an optical, it takes a true K value and then calculates the measurement. And putting it all together, having a good axial length, good keratometry, uh, the final outcome depends on the formulae. When you're using an immersion, you cannot integrate many of the newer generation formula. But in an optical, it is all defect. So you can have all the build and you can actually upgrade it to the newer formula as and when it comes. Because the formulas are getting evolved every fortnight actually. So you need to have an option to integrate this into the system. That's possible with the optical biometer. So an optical biometer is no longer a luxury, but it's a basic and a necessary tool. But for the time being at least, the modern ophthalmic practice must employ both the ultrasound and optical biometer technology and the ophthalmologist must keep an ultrasound biometer on hand for patients who cannot be measured with the optical biometry. The two technologies will be complementary and both are still essential tools for the cataract surgeon. So always have it and uh, when you have an optical biometer, always make sure you do your immersion once in a while because in a month time if you are not doing an immersion and suddenly if you are happen to do an immersion, you may not be so comfortable doing it. So once in a while, it's always better to keep doing the immersion also. So thank you so much. So now I'd like to call Dr. Padiba for her talk on managing a dissatisfied patient. That was a very nice talk, sir. Uh, I think you have covered up uh, half the thing what I had to say. So. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Pratibha Devi Nivian, and I'm here to talk on how to handle a dissatisfied patient. So when we talk about this topic, I would say first prevention is better than cure. Rather than struggling after a complication has happened, it's always better to prevent it before it happened. So next, <coughs> next slide. Not moving, sir. Okay. So how can we prevent those unsatisfied patients? It can be in the preoperative care, by intraoperative care and postoperative care. So in preoperative care, by doing a good slit lamp evaluation, many of subtle things which we take it for granted can sometimes cause a lot of problem postoperatively. Like for example, this simple conjunctival calysis, it's just nothing but a redundant loose conjunctiva which happens with aging or chronic irritation and tearing can cause this conjunctival calysis and these patients are one of the most unhappy patients postoperatively complaining of lot of discomfort and irritation. So address this preoperatively and warn the patient so they might have watering issues. Sorry. They might have watering issues. Um, um, so that they don't question you much at the end of the surgery. And then we have to do a good slit lamp evaluation to see for gutte or any fugue endothelial dystrophy to avoid unnecessary post-op complications. We have to see for faint scars so that patient don't complain that I don't have 100% vision because this is the era which we're dealing with a refractive cataract surgery gone on those days when they did a cataract surgery for just to improve the vision acuity. And please look for pseudo exfoliation and please warn the patient that they have to come for a regular IOP check postoperatively because it has been reported in literature that 26% of the patients with the pseudo exfoliation can end up with glaucoma postoperatively. And then comes the lid hygiene. So a proper and thorough good lid examination is mandatory because these are patients who can end up with complications like end up or might trouble us with uh, chronic irritation and uh, watering. And then dry eye examination. Uh, dry eye examination is part of for regular preoperative workup. And patients with uh, um, dryness preoperatively are warned about the postoperative need for medicines uh, for a few months at least. 
and then do a good fundus evaluation. If fundus is not seen preoperatively because of the dense cataract, we have to definitely put a word to the patient that their retina has to be examined at the end of one month during their follow-up so that there is no questioning or there's no argument after the one month of the surgery, why is my vision not improving and um, uh, why was that not explained earlier. And uh, this is one study which ha uh, reported that they have done um, a macular OCT for patients who undergone cataract surgery and they found a lot of macular pathologies which was missed or underestimated by standard fundus examination. So many times when the media is hazy, we just report it as uh, foveal reflex dull, but then sometimes a macular hole or a mild macular edema could be missed. So it is an ideal choice at least in uh, premium IOLs uh, to uh, have as a regular practice to do an OCT prior surgery. And explain the IOL cho choices to the patients. And, um, so first, uh, understand their needs and then explain all the options available and make them comfortable financially, reassure them and allow them to decide. And if there is any astigmatism, explain them about the option of toric IOL or the postoperative glasses. And then the preoperative, these are simple tips. Uh, this can make them unhappy even if you do a good cataract surgery at the end of the day. So the patients have to be clearly explained about the pre-op topical medicine, timing of surgery, venue, food intake, medicines, and topical explanation. And the intraoperative care, um, I, would, I would stress this because practically uh, less waiting time and, uh, um, and uh, following good theater disciplines also matter a lot com coming to an unsatisfied patient. They, if they have some un uh, unhappy experiences during the surgery, uh, also they tend to be unhappy with the course of the surgery uh, even if they are 6-6 six, six later on. Even after doing all these, we encounter unhappy patients and that is the topic which I am going to talk here. So the post-operative unhappy patient uh, could be an early unhappy patient or a late unhappy patient. So early unhappy patients are one because of refractive surprise, re dysphotopsia, aberrations, and late, uh, late unhappy patients could be because of dry related issues. So why refractive surprise? Like uh, Sir said, a one millimeter difference in an axial length or an, uh, uh, can cause a three diopter difference in the Niall power calculation. So um, uh, a, a, pr a prior good K reading axial length and IOL power calculation is very important. So it is mandatory to do a good IOL power calculation. And if there are issues like a long um, uh, eye or short eye or a post uh, retinal surgery eye or a previous refractive surgery, we have to take effort to do a good IOL power calculation with the higher, uh, with the uh, latest technologies available um, uh, in the market and then go ahead with the surgery to avoid unnecessary post-operative refractive surprise. And then um, uh, the correct IOL has to be inserted. So um, in, in post, uh, for post-classic patients, the expectations are also high and the corneal power is overestimated and the IOL power is underestimated because of the flattened cornea. And so in post-operative patients, uh, uh, we follow the Barrett's formula, which is available uh, free online. So, um, uh, so this is the uh, um, uh, Barrett's Truque formula, which is available online. And it is very simple to use. They just ask few data, which as uh, Jain Thun sir told that uh, uh, they are available uh, in optical biometers, the uh, uh, true K value, uh, Y to white and certain values, which is uh, self-explanatory. Those details have to be provided. And th then that gives the formula, the right, uh, the right IOL, uh, which we have to insert. So, um, why is it moving fast? It is moving by itself, I think. I will touch. Okay. See, it is moving fast. I'm not doing it. Okay. So um, what they say is for refractive surpri uh, surprise, if uh, the surprise is less than two diopters, then it is better to go in for a non-invasive procedure like a LASIK or a TransPRK. Uh, if, uh, if the diopter, if the refractive surprise is more than two, then it is better to go in for other options like uh, a piggyback eye oil or an, uh, or a piggyback eye oil or a lens exchange. So, so as I told, if the doctor, if the refractive surprise is less, it is better to go for a LASIK or a TransPRK. And uh, corneal surgeons prefer a TransPRK. Uh, um, oh, sorry. 
um, so sorry so uh, if we have a, a post operative surprise so the first thing we say uh, we uh, try to convince the patient or reassure and ask, provide them glasses but if they are very motivated to get uh, to be without glasses then we uh, we uh, either give them an option of ablative surgery or an iol exchange um, uh, or a piggyback iol so without doing it is wrong sir See this, I am not touching, but I don't know. That alone is going fast. Okay. Okay. So basically, if the refractive error is, if the refractive surprise is less, we can either give the patient an option of glasses, contact lens. If they are okay and if they are comfortable with that, we, we, are, uh, j uh, we can uh, just uh, ha make the patient happy with only that. If the patient is not happy with glasses and uh, uh, contact lens, and if the cataract surgeon has an uh, um, uh, uh, has an approach with the uh, ha um, has a LASIK uh, machine, then he can suggest the patient to undergo LASIK uh, uh, or uh, trans PRK if the power is uh, less than if the refractive surprise is less than two, um, and uh, um, uh, so. Um, the, the corneal surgeons prefer to do a uh, trans PRK with, uh, uh, be, uh, um, compared to LASIK because they say for doing a LASIK, the wound has to be completely healed and we should give a period of at least six months uh, because while doing LASIK, otherwise the wound might open up. Uh, trans PRK is safer, it doesn't cause much IOP increase also. And uh, piggyback IOLs are uh, d done for lens exchange. Uh, piggyback IOL is nothing but placing uh, uh, another IOL over the already placed IOL. So when there is a refractive surprise, uh, the amount of refractive uh, error which has been created is measured and then it's simple and it's just put uh, in the sulcus if, uh, if it is a silicone or in the bag if it's an uh, acrylic. And uh, it is relatively expensive compared to LASIK. But this can be done by anti-segment surgeries who do not have any uh, 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 access to a LASIK or a trans PRK. So the IL power calculation um, uh, for uh, piggyback is uh, by uh, sorry uh, for uh, hyperopic uh, residual refractive error. The power of uh, piggyback IOL is just by multiplying the desired spherical equivalent into 1.5. For myopic refractive error, it is the same as the spherical equivalent. But the contraindications for uh, the uh, for doing piggyback IOL is if there is already uh, loose onules or if the bag is uh, if there is a uh, already uh, um, uh, uh, torn PCR if the bag is weak or if there is uh, glaucoma or if the patient had poor endothelial clone it is not advisable to uh, use a piggyback IOL uh, and the complications with piggyback IOL is uh, interlenticular complication like how we develop a um, primary capsular opacification in between lens there can be opacification it's called as the red rock syndrome um, and pigment dispersion can be a problem which can cause glaucoma later on. Endothelial decomposition can occur. Uh, the um, piggyback lens also can dislocate and uh, glaucoma and hypema or other complications. And uh, if uh, um, IOL exchange is another op option if the, if the refractive surprise is identified early and uh, managed early, it is, it is not a good choice if we have to do it after a later period because the bag would be fibrosed and uh, um, so the e exchange of lens might not be that easy. Uh, so IOL exchange can be done in the earlier period. Uh, the uh, wound ex en explan or the expl enlargement can be done and the lens can be ex explanted if it is a rigid IOL or if it is a hydrophobic IOL or um, if it is a hydrophilic IOL in, with, an, with, the small, with the already existing incision, uh, a simple cut can be given and the lens can be just withdrawn through the same section. And uh, uh, during IOL exchange, we have to be cap ca careful with the capsule posteriorly and the endothelium anteriorly. And uh, as I already said, timing is very important as uh, fi with fibrous bag, we have to be definitely careful about the bag because the whole bag can come. So we have to be prepared with uh, other iris IOL fixing options. And uh, dysphotopsia is uh, another uh, um, 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 another problem which makes the patients happy every day, um, I mean at least uh, um, uh, two or three times in a week we always hear patients saying that I, hear, I see rings, I see halos or I see shadows. So positive dysphotopsia is uh, the uh, patients perceiving, 
glare halos or ring like thing so it is basically because of the lens design iol design so they say that the square diols give more of these uh, photopsias and lenses with higher end of refraction has uh, causes more of this photopsia and surface reflectivity also causes this photopsia and negative photopsia very often i hear uh, patients telling that temporarily i am able to see some uh, obstruction uh, so that is uh, uh, very common finding every day uh, i mean uh, every day we hear this complaint um, so this is caused due to reflection of the temporal light and uh, it occurs in patients with large angle kappa and uh, nasal anterior capsule override and high aperopia so in all these patients the first thing is you give time to uh, adapt so neural adaptation is the one thing which we have to advise the patient reassure them and uh, um, uh, i will tell what to do for the other so aberrations um, aberrations is one and the problem which which causes an unhappy patient so aberrations can be detected by uh, various uh, machines we had a wonderful talk by jayanthan sir in the morning so um, basically the aberrations we uh, with those machines we should find whether we are having corneal aberrations or lenticular aberrations so if it is because of lenticular aberrations we have to probably think of an iol lab change or they say optic simple optic capture can also negate these kind of dysphotopsias so how to manage yes neural adaptation and if uh, not simple optic capture or a lens exchange is, a, is an option so take home message will be a proper pre operative workup and uh, uh, evaluation is mandatory and uh, manage intraoperative complications with care and do not panic when you see a refractive surprise reassure the patient talk to them do a good conversation understand their needs and then give off whatever we can from our side and patient explanation and reassurance is ultimately the one uh, which uh, will help just i want to quote one thing one uh, one high end trifocal patient who used to come to my hospital always say that she sees sunflower after surgery now when i was when i was reading for this particular topic only i realized there are so many things so but what i did was just reassurance and just gave her a glasses but she used to come and meet me once in 3 months happily going so that reassurance is only the most important thing rather than all these technologies have compassion and passion and talk to them thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you dr pradeepa the last point which you mentioned that's what i actually wanted from the talk the reassurance so as a clinical director she has enumerated the clinical points very nicely one which i want to add is that a single point if somebody asked me to uh, manage a dissatisfied patient what are we going to increase your chair time increasing your chair time before your surgery so she has clearly mentioned what are all the causes of a dissatisfied patient make a checklist make sure all these are not done for your cataract surgery patient may be difficult for a very busy practitioner but identifying that one patient will actually reduce your chair time a lot post operatively so try to give importance to these points pre operatively make sure this doesn't uh, harm the patient post operatively and in case uh, in spite of all this if something goes wrong again increase your chair time sit with the patient exactly like what she said they don't even need a lasik they don't even need a prk they don't need a piggy bag all that they need is a reassurance and go for glasses they'll be very happy because when you want to go for a prk that can lead to another set of complications that may actually make the patient very unhappy so all they need is they want you to sit here to them sometimes we have patients who will come every day sit talk to us for 15 minutes and end of the day they'll go back happy so all you need is increase your chair time make the patient comfortable at some point of time they will become more happy and they will be satisfied and they go away so that's reassurance that one thing which i liked uh, as uh, your take home right so the next of uh, talk would be by dr atik shek he is the chairman aic of uh, tamil nadu ophthalmic association so then big question which a uh, clinician happens is like what uh, how, what and how to invest is it worth investing in uh, now nowadays it has become a fancy gadgets Uh, what and one plus gives is what an uh, iphone 14 also gives but the choice is going to be yours and how to decide which machine to invest is what dr atik is going to talk on uh, thank you jayanthan for giving this uh, opportunity to talk on investing in machine behind the man well first uh, a big thanks to you not because i am an expert in this but doing this presentation i learned so many mistakes i am personally doing in my practice so i think i have to go home and uh, start implementing what i have learned over the past few days it's really tempting when we work in a corporate setup or a, 
a practice which is flourishing as a second or a third doctor, we seeing about 30, 40 patients in a day and then uh, operating maybe about 40, 50 cataracts in a month to immediately start private practice and go to the next level. But then the big question is anybody starting practice will want to have a theater and a FACO machine. This is something we need, we feel as basic. So before you buy a machine, first educating ourselves, getting to know the technical know-how about the equipment is very important before going ahead and doing the purchase. So knowing in depth about every equipment, not only FACO machine, every equipment is important before deciding to buy what we want. <clears throat> Who's more important, man or machine? I personally feel getting trained in that particular department is more important than going for a high-end machine. Having a hi-fi car, not knowing how to drive it is bad. Rather than go for a mediocre equipment with good skills, you'll be able to save a hole in your pocket. Horses for courses. This is something very important. No point in buying a Ferrari and driving it in a village, nor a seven-star hotel with a helipad will run. You have to do a practice pattern analysis, decide on the type of patients expected to come to you, come to a conclusion on the nature of city where you are, whether it's a tier 1, tier 2 or tier 3, decide on the packages that you can do, have a conservative analysis of how many cases you will be able to do in a month, what is the expected growth which can happen over the past 2 to 3 years and then decide on buying the machine. No point in buying something that is the best. We were just having a discussion sitting down. A doctor has asked him which microscope to buy. Of course, all of us will feel tempted to buy a, a Zeiss microscope which, which gives amazing optics. But then, will we, will we be able to break even? Will we be able to uh, pay the dues? Will the bundling options, will we be able to satisfy? Or all our profits we will make and ensure that the company grows and not us. That is not the way to go forward. So for a startup, what is needed is you need to come to a collective analysis of what will be the total cost of the center. So say for example, if we come to an estimate of say 1 crore is the total cost that we need for building that center and you need to buy a machine also. You need to set aside a working capital of about 30%. In other words, if your total budget estimated is 1 crore, you should have about 30% of the value. In other words, 30 lakhs as your reserve fund with you available. That is what is called as working capital. So the advantage of that money is, suppose you have a lean period, your practice doesn't kick off the way you want or some emergency expense happens, you will have some money in your kitty which will ensure you keep running for the first window period of a year or so. Otherwise, you'll end up buying more loans end up paying more EMI and crash land. That is not the way forward. So you should have a working capital of approximately 30% of your initial investment that is planned. So your initial investment will include the working capital also. That is how the calculation has to be done. And then how much loan can we take? Normally what financial advisors, experts and auditors say is never or it's not ideal to go for loan beyond 50% of the initial value of any equipment or any organization. Again, say for example, 1 crore, you can think of 50 lakhs from your savings, maybe some properties disposed, looking at group funding or maybe an investor. But if you consider an investor or a friend who is willing to pump in money or group funding, we should have an open conversation with the person that it is practically not possible to give positive returns or give a lot of money back within the first one or two years. It is safe to have a window period of at least three years, to be pessimistic, five years. None of us expected three years back, we will all be sitting at home, shutting our hospitals and doing nothing. Few years back, we had issues with demonetization, GST, lot of issues which pull down our practice. So there is no point in being overly optimistic and then burning a hole in the pocket and then crash landing. That is with regards to a startup. <clears throat> and then when you have a startup, we have to consider this rule 72, which again I learned just a few days back. When you want to, when, or when you're considering doing an investment, we have to consider uh, optimistic returns of at least 14% uh, 
from what you have invested. Say, one crore you are investing, you should get at least 14% returns per year. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. You apply this rule 72 to this 14%, that is 72 divided by 14, approximately you will take 5 years to break even. This is for any investment. You have a budget of about 1 crore, the working capital is 30 lakhs. Say total is 1.3 crores. In 5 years, you have to make about 18 lakhs profit every year. If you are not able to do this, it doesn't make sense starting anything. Say if you are going to make 8% returns or 7% returns, just keeping the money in your bank and even the uh, fixed deposit returns that you get will be higher than what you are investing. So it really doesn't make sense starting a practice if you are generating less than 12 to 14 percent of what you have invested. For a running organization, when you want to consider or when you want to buy an equipment, the cost of ownership is absolutely different from the cost of purchase. Normally when we want to buy an equipment, the company gives a quotation. Unfortunately, that quotation is nowhere the cost of your ownership. Your ownership will include cost of consumables, spares, maintenance expenses as well as the life expectancy of the patient when you're thinking of the machine when you're thinking of buying a FACO machine we all get a quote for one handpiece and the equipment again it doesn't make sense we need a standby handpiece the full equipment what sort of tips and sleeves are used how many cases those tips and sleeves will last tubings whether it is disposable or reusable and the cost of CMC this was again my personal example, an equipment which I wanted to buy about three, year, three to four years back and we were having a discussion as to what to buy. My father is an ophthalmologist, joined him about 13 years back. One MNC company gave me a quote of 22 lakhs. Another Indian company gave me a quote of 18 lakhs. The equipment by the MNC company had amazing aesthetics. The machine looked beautiful. The printout was way better than the Indian company. The difference was hardly 3.5 lakhs. The MNC company told me, we'll make you a, a, a key speaker, we'll give you talking chances. All that was uh, told to me and then it had big brand value. I took this to my father and said, the difference is only 3.5 lakhs, I think we'll be able to make it up. It's not a big difference, I think that company is worth it. Then his advice for me was, you talk to both of them, find out the AMC value, warranty for 5 years. And then you come back to me and let me know what is the difference. If you feel it is justifiable, we'll find the equipment. The Indian company said it's not mandate to have AMC. If you have a breakdown, we'll be able to come and service it at any point. They were based in my state or I'm from Tamil Nadu. They were based in my state and they said we'll be able to service it as quickly as possible. There is no need for AMC and the spares, few things what I found out, certain key areas where we will get uh, repair issues. The difference was around 9.5 lakhs. Initially the difference was 3.5. Later on when all this was added, between these two brands, the difference was a solid 10 lakhs. I decided to buy the Indian company equipment. In 5 years we broke broken even and I am on a profit. In 3 years we broke even and I am on a profit. So this has to be considered before buying any equipment. Not only FACO machine, any equipment. And again when we buy a machine of say for, say for a value of 20 lakhs, we expect it to work for a bare minimum of 5 years, optimistically for 7 years duration. We look to recover the cost of the equipment in 4 years and we feel in the last 2 years we will be able to make money. So, in five, for you, so for this again the math was applied and I felt that 5 lakhs profit per year or you make around 41 to 42,000 profit, you will be able to break even in 4 years. This was my understanding or my way of calculating how an equipment will give returns then this math is totally wrong. What we need to understand is we buy a machine. That machine will go off in 7 years. The same machine after 7 years is not going to cost the same 20 lakhs. The machine will literally go to scrap. When we want to buy a new machine, the cost of that equipment from 20 will bare minimum move up to 30 lakhs on a very conservative scale. So you are not looking at earning 20 lakh from the machine but you need to earn 50 lakh profit from the machine otherwise you will be in trouble when that machine conks you will not have money to replace the equipment. There is no point in having a fancy equipment and then degrading or buying a suboptimal machine the next time. So if you see here again the same math is applied 
you need to make approximately you want to break even in 7 years and buy a new machine you need to make about 60000 rupees profit in a month and not 40000 and this money that you've made normally what i used to do or most of us do is this profit that is generated we usually use it to buy another equipment or for something else in the organization this money has to be parked in a space where the money is not used so that we have this money to buy the equipment after this machine conks otherwise we will be in trouble so when we are upgrading we need to ensure that the additional cost that is spent gives better performance more reliability and it is safe for the patient it is not advisable to for pray just for brand value <clears throat> it is not advisable to listen to some fancy person in a conference uh, talking of a high-end machine if it doesn't suit us it is advisable not to buy the equipment if we buy things we know we don't need we may have to sell up things that we need thank you so much for your patient hearing Thank you, Dr. Atik. Uh, by this, we actually wanted to open up this Pandora's box because uh, even if you want to invest 10,000 rupees in your uh, share market, we'll have a financial consultant. But we, when it comes to buying an equipment, we always go by the brand sentiment or uh, the binge uh, shopping is what we do. So we need to do not just for the FECO equipment, whether it is for your, even for an autoclave or an immersion ultrasound we really knew, need to do this financial uh, planning and then go ahead uh, because the cost of equipment is getting very very high up and the practice is getting uh, saturated nowadays so this will definitely uh, work if you give a homework uh, for the financial planning right so next i would like to invite dr tamlarasi uh, as we all know, as I said in the beginning of the session, that uh, the cataract is becoming a refractive cataract surgery. So, to build up a refractive cataract surgery, to scale up your practice, uh, so she is going to give the tips on it. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, I thank Dr. Jainthan for this opportunity. We know that refractive cataract surgery has been there for many years, but few of the surgeons are not comfortable adopting and offering this service. Here, I will be sharing my experience, which helped me to bridge the gap. With cataract, what happens? The lens not only loses its clarity, but also loses the reading range, which is an important function. So the patient can choose whether he can replace one or both of them. So as a surgeon, we should be able to provide the patient the education and the opportunity to enhance the vision, not just restore the vision. When one can start this practice, when one is performing a successful FECO emulsification without any complication, I do not mean the complication which is like PCR zonal dialysis, but meticulous wound construction so that the SIA is not so much variable and also making a well-centered rexis. This not only prevents PCO, but also prevents the asymmetric contracture which can happen in the post-operative period, which can lead to a lens decentration or change in the effective lens position. One true yardstick to measure the success of cataract surgery is achieving the target emetropia. So we should have a consistent post-operative outcomes even in the monofocal eye wall which we are implanting. So incorporating a premium eye wall practice requires all these six pearls which I will be talking about. That is prerequisites, what technology to invest in, and achieving the target emetropia and also educating the patient and the staff who help us to do it. And as a surgeon, we should have a complete understanding of the eye well, what we are implanting and choose the right patient and also be aware of the surgical refinements which we are need to do. So the first and foremost question is, do I need to own a most advanced technology before offering these services? Like Dr. Atik has clearly explained what is the need. So to the left, I do agree that I practice in a center where I have access to optical biometry, higher end FECO machine, LRCS and digital image guiding uh, surgery. But I do visit centers where we have only immersion A scan and manual keratometry and we do premium eye will practice. So what one should understand is this optical biometry is idiot proof. That is when a measurement is taken by an optometrist who is A and B, the inter-observer variability is going to be less in spite of the 
experience in acquiring the reading but to do a good acquire a good measurement with immersion and a manual keratometry we need a well trained optometrist i think uh, dr pratibha has covered a uh, post op residual refractive error in uh, detail so one of the most common cause of patient dissatisfaction post premium eye oil surgery is the residual refractive error so we have to plan that we are going to hit the target emetropia so how can we do that we have to monitor our own results even with monofocal eye oil practice we are not looking at the best corrected visual acuity we have to look at the uncorrected visual acuity and it should be around 66 or 6 by 7.5 unless and until the patient has a pre existing astigmatism so we should have a dedicated staff and a good equipment to acquire this and do the same so the scientific evidence shows even with the advanced instrument and the most latest formula we'll be able to achieve only within 92% of the time within 0.5 diopter of the target refraction so what is the best to do we should always start with the accurate measurement and check whether the measurement what we have taken is correct and feed in the data which is the most advanced formula whatever is there which is best suited for the eye and calculate the eye hole power here i'll be just explaining how we deal with this premium eye hole patient the workup once the patient is diagnosed to have a cataract the first thing we do is the keratometry value either it be an optical biometry or the manual keratometry once we know that we know whether the patient is having a significant astigmatism or not so this is the base based upon which we do the counseling if the patient does not have an astigmatism we enter the value of axial length acquired from the immersion biometry and the k reading obtained from the manual keratometry and feed this data in the barrett universal 2 formula which is there in the online calculator but the key here is you have to use the ultrasound a constant and calculate the power and we implant the eye well and we get a good outcome what if the patient has a significant astigmatism so you can see that the immersion axial length has been taken the ac depth the lens thickness every, everything is acquired from the immersion uh, uh, biometry and the same thing is entered into the barrett calculator for calculating the power of the toric eye well to be implanted the variables which we enter here is the k reading axial length and the optical acd we are not going to enter the lens thickness and white to white which is optional so whenever we think of a toric eye well power calculation the factors which comes into our mind is what is the sia what is the storicity ratio what is the pca how am i going to include all this in the calculation this barrett toric calculator which is there in the online makes all these things simple the sia what we are going to use for any temporal clear corneal incision of 2.4 mm we are going to use a value of 0.1 and for indigenous eye well if you are going to use 2.8 you can use around 2.0.2 diopters and the barrett toric calculator itself calculates the storicity ratio and gives the toric eye well to be implanted and you can see there the predicted pca which is there here so it the barrett toric calculator itself the predicted pca and includes this in the toric eye well power calculation so everything is made simple and we can just enter the data and get the toric power to be implanted but the one catch is we should not be going with the t3 t4 model because the t3 model what it has been shown is for the imported eye wells and we can see that uh, for indigenous eye well the t3 will be different rather than the t3 of the other model eye wells so always look for the cylindrical power at the eye wall plane and then order the eye well so when you are accuring the value of any axial length measurement or k reading we should be sure that we are getting the accurate measurement if you are going to put the sub optimal inaccurate measurement even in the modern formula we will get eye well per calculation error so it is all about precision and identifying these error before doing the eye well power calculation so how can we avoid errors always compare both eyes even if the other eye has been operated put it in a pseudo phacic mode and look for the asymmetry in the eye well power k and the axial length so what if there is an asymmetric power so recheck the value in a different instrument if you have access to if you don't have access to a different instrument remeasure it can be done on the some other day or after few hours on the same day so remeasure to check for consistency and also correlate clinically if one eye is more myopic or hyperopic look for clinical findings whether the eye has a myopic fundus or a hyper hypermetropic fundus and in case of acquiring the quality measurements 
in immersion a scan always look for the quality of the spikes it should be steeply rising and to the maximum and with optical biometer we have the signal to noise ratio which has to be more than one and we have this color coded signals the green indicates the value is correct and when we are accuring the keratometric value look for the quality of the myers the myers has to be clear and uh, in, when we are using optical biometry this led points will not be crisp and pointed you can see this teardrop it indicates the ocular surface disease and our keratometry value will be erroneous so i'll be explaining with two examples here you can see that the i wall power difference between the right and the left eye is 3 diopters and the axial length there is a difference of 0.7 mm so i identified this and asked them to repeat the i wall master on the day of surgery on repeating this the i axial length was almost same and the i wall power between the eye was 22 this is a second example you can see that the k value in the right eye is 0.5 and the left is 2.67 and on slit lamp examination the patient had severe dry eyes punctate epithelial erosions once putting the patient on lubricants and optimizing the surface the value acquire, acquired the k value was almost same so it is identifying these errors which helps us to perform better now we have come to the point where majority of the i wall power calculation errors comes from the k value so if the myers are not clear or if the standard deviation value which comes along with the reading is more than 0.2 diopters look for dry eye ocular surface disease and if it is present treat and remeasure if the ocular surface is normal then we have to think of other causes of irregular astigmatism then we have to perform the topo or tomography additional investigation to make sure that our k value is correct the taking extra time in this 10 30% of the patients will help us to perform better once a surgeon believes in the technology then he can talk comfortably to the patient regarding the benefits of the i wall and in our clinical flow we can see that majority of the time the patient spends with the counselors and the optometrist so we should educate them also and if a new person joins we should ensure that there is an employee to employer to employer training also it is happening so as i said earlier all those errors in the biometry will be communicated to the optometrist who acquired the reading so they will also be aware that such things can happen and they will be educated so as i said the first thing we are going to do in our hospital is the keratometry once if the patient is want spectacle independence and you have counseled them thoroughly for a trifocal eye wall but later on if you are going to do a biometry and the patient has a significant astigmatism then you have to recounsel them for a trifocal toric so the patient will be much confused so always start with a k value so as i said we do uh, optical keratometry and if the patient is interested in premium eye wall then we choose the eye wall to be implanted the fourth point understanding about the eye wall because the premium eye wall is not about the 66 vision but it is about the visual quality so the visual quality depends upon the eye wall correction how much it corrects the spherical aberration or the chromatic aberration and what is the optic whether it has a diffractive rings or change in the curvature or incorporation of some spherical aberration to extend the depth of vision understand what is the eye wall is about and though we have improved in the optic technology that is previous bifocal eye walls have to have more of a dysphotic phenomena but now the latest trifocal eye walls the dysphotic phenomena is less but it is not completely eliminated and we should also understand a range of vision the eye wall offers we can tell that the premium eye wall technology is still imperfect it cannot mimic the natural human crystalline lens what we had around 20 years so understand the defocus curve by seeing a defocus curve a surgeon can understand what is the range of vision it is going to provide so when you are deciding an eye wall it is not about new and everything new is not going to perform the best so look at the optics whether the optic platform has been implanted in millions of eyes and is performed correctly and also ask the feedback from the colleagues it is more of a user experience and they and they will share their experience with the same eye wall and when you are taking up an eye wall give a trial period where you will implant and learn about how is the post operative outcome and the patient satisfaction with the same eye wall choosing the patient the first and foremost thing is patient's understanding that there will be dysphotic phenomena and with neural adaptation it will settle with time but clearly explain them that the neural adaptation has a certain time period so that the dysphotic phenomena is going to reduce we do not have any pre op technology which measures this uh, dysphotic uh, neural adaptation period so be clear about their expectation the second important thing is learn about the patient's visual needs what is the most common thing and what is the range of vision they are going to spend their daily activities 
and also understand the reading point. Few patients will be reading newspaper which is held very close and few of them will be using tap to read the same which is held at arm's distance. And also the height of the patient determines the arm span. So understand this and choose the IOL. And important thing, the other important thing is we have to look for red flag signs which will prevent us implanting a premium IOL. This includes ocular surface disease, any zonular pathology and the macular pathology. As has been said, ocular surface will also cause post-op patient dissatisfaction and also residual refractive error because of the inaccurate care reading. So after looking into all these things, give the patient the option. Here, after the in our hospital, after the biometry, the counselor tells about the options of IVL which will suit them best and also talks about the price issue. So when the patient comes to us, they will have certain doubts which we will discuss and clear them and help them to finalize the lens option. So it's more of a customized approach rather than one single lens approach. When you're starting with implanting a premium, an IOL, I would advise you to start with toric lens because the optic is not different, it just have a toricity in it. And don't start with a high cylinder because we know that for every one degree of rotation, we lose 3%. So for 10 degree, we lose 33%. So if you're choosing uh, to implant a 4.5 diopters of a high cylindrical uh, eye well, if it rotates by 10%, you'll be left with 1.25 diopters. So always choose a moderate degree of uh, astigmatism to correct with. And everybody will have in mind, what is a cutoff point to start correcting? We should understand it is different for against the rule and with the rule. Posterior cornea has against rule astigmatism. So it adds to the anterior corneal against the rule astigmatism and it decreases the with the rule astigmatism. So it is lower for against rule astigmatism. We can even start with 0.75 diopters. Whereas for with the rule, the cutoff is really high. It can be 1 to 1.25 diopters. And always ensure if you're implanting a multifocal IOL, you should correct the minimal astigmatism, whatever the patient has. What are the surgical refinements? This is the last uh, pearl. For toric IOL, are ink marks sufficient? Yeah, it is much more uh, sufficient. What I do is, Keep the patient undilated in the slit lamp and I do not use speculum and just lift the lid but ensure that you're not pressing the orbit. And before proceeding, check both eyes which is the picture which is given there. So this horizontal slit should be uniformly cutting the pupil. This is to ensure that the head is not tilted. And once this has been confirmed, then I make a small scratch in the peripheral cornea with a 26 gauge needle and then mark. What happens if you mark, sometimes it can blanch. Since there is a mark in the peripheral cornea, even if blanches and it disappears, you can see in the slit lamp, you can see a fine mark, which is marked with a 26 gauge needle and then has been stained. So this lasts even if you take some two to three hours to start the surgery. So next we have marked the reference mark and how to mark the access mark. So this should be marked prior and you should make that the area is dry. You should, your cornea, the uh, surface, the ocular surface should not be wet, otherwise it can lead to marking. So these are the reference mark which you have marked and use the Mendy's ring and keep 0, 180 degree aligned with these marks and using the toric marker and this is the 15 degree which I am marking and always ensure that the, the light reflex which you are seeing is centered on the pupil. This ensures that it is centered and once this is done, then you mark it. If the ocular surface is dry, then whatever mark we are going to get, it will be very thin. It will not smudge. So we can get a thin mark. Perform the routine cataract removal and implanting a lens is same as a routine lens. One thing what we have to do is like we have to, when we are implanting it, keep it 10 to 15 degree off axis in the counterclockwise because all the lens looks uh, rotates clockwise because of the haptic configuration. So once this is done, perform a thorough viscoelastic wash front of the eye well and even behind the eye well and then rotate it to the axis which has to be implanted. So here I'm going behind and uh, removing the viscoelastic and then finally aligning the eye well. So when you're aligning the eye well, you can just keep the irrigation on and take a Sinsky hook and to align it to the degree to be implanted and after aligning it, just push the lens a little bit posteriorly so that it settles well in the back. And even in small pupils, you can retract the pupil and identify the marks and then align the IOL. I'm just retracting using the dialer and seeing the toric marks and doing. Otherwise, you can use an iris hooks to identify the marks and then align it perfectly. 
So for multifocal IOL, the EC first patients are the hyperopes because their near vision is already retarded. But do not start with a moderate myope who, have a, who has a good near vision all throughout the life. High myopes, because of the high axial length, nailing the IOL per calculation might be difficult in initially. So start with the hyperopic patients. And uh, the placing a premium, uh, the trifocal IOL is like usual. Make sure that your excess is well centered and align the IOL with the corneal reflex with the Purkinje image what you are seeing. And you can see that the central ring is uh, well aligned with the uh, Purkinje image what we are seeing. And here for aligning a multifocal toric IOL, make sure that the Purkinje image is aligned and then align it to the axis to be implanted. The last thing is like we might have few patients will not be satisfied how much of e uh, experience you have and how much careful you are. But we have to, like as uh, Pratibha has clearly alluded to, we have to sit with the patient, spend chair time and always go through a, um, a stepwise manner in identifying what is the cause of dissatisfaction and always have a colleague of yours who is well versed in the laser refractive correction so that if you have any uh, residual error, you can refer to. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amalasi. That was really exhaustive. So uh, the one take home which I would like to suggest is that uh, these premium IOLs are not no more a luxury. They are actually mandatory. Uh, talk to the patient. Definitely they need this. So there should not be any hesitation or uh, uh, this thing to start off. So start your refractive surgery practice. You will be refractive cataract surgery practice. Move on to the other thing. So the order would be like definitely start off with the toric IOL because correcting the toricity is the one important thing that we need to do to get a satisfied patient. Then we can move on to the EDOF or the CRV lenses that we are getting which will actually completely remove all the dyspotopsic uh, um, hurdles for us. Then probably once you are comfortable then we can move on to the trifocals. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Dr. Nivian, the academic director of MNI hospital to talk on the microscopes. Thank you Dr. Jayanthin respected teachers, senior ophthalmologists, my dear friends. So the topic given to me was choosing the right microscope. And I, just a brief introduction, we all know us as an operating surgical microscope is the most important optical instrument in the modern era of ophthalmic surgeries. So it totally provides magnified and illuminated high quality images in the small ophthalmic structures. And being binocular, it gives additional benefit to high quality stereopsis. So I thought being the last speaker of the last day of the session, so I thought we'll do something different. So rather than me, we have the basic principles of the microscopes and all different parts of the microscope. So we have a very good audience here for the last session. So it would be more appropriate and more practical if we could take any questions from you and then be able to answer. Because in the panel, we have one cataract surgeon, we have a pediatric ophthalmologist, we have an oculoplasty surgeon and a cataract surgeon. So if there could be any questions or doubts regarding anything related to microscopes, will be happy to answer rather than just talking about principles. We all know it's made of four parts. It's got the basic uh, optical system, the illumination system, the arms or the hands and the stand and the foot pedal. And then basically it is divided into three groups. You have the basic microscopes, then you have the mid-range microscopes and the high-end microscopes which have other attachments like the Callisto, the OCT guided microscopes. So it will be only appropriate like if you have any questions from the audience regarding microscopes, the companies the cost or where to use which, which microscopes. Nobody. Yeah. Good start. Hello, sir. It's a very basic question. I work in a uh, government setup, sir. I just started up. So I want to know about the basic microscope needs. What do we ne have? I am having Apasami Brilliant Plus, an old microscope. Uh, I have been asking my seniors, they have told me, ad advised me to use a uh, Retroglow or Omniglow, whatever it is, that will add up enhancement uh, and assist in doing surgeries. But I have uh, done some research on these Retroglows. They uh, uh, decreases the stereopsis, they say, sir. So yeah. can you comment on that and also tell me about, uh, I'm planning to buy a basic uh, microscope. So which microscope I 
I should purchase. Excellent. Like, so the first part I'll answer. The second part, I think Atik has got the attachment, so he'll be able to answer. So basically, what we mean by a basic microscope is: Does your microscope have the X-Y axis control? Then, yeah, and it is only useful for anterior segment. Like it does not have an attachment where you can later on fix a biome or have attachments because that will not bear the weight. So basic microscope, as you said, you already have Apasami. Then we have the Zeiss one of our model. Then we have the Topcon OMS five model, and then. Uh, we have the Leica, isn't it? So what basic is it? It's very good for cataract surgery. And as you rightly said, the glow, all microscopes have a good amount of red glow. I think now it is fantasized by the other companies that you need more retro glow, but then there is less stereopsis. And also the depth also decreases when you have this enhanced glow. And I, that's what Atik is actually having it. So his experience will be better on this stuff. Uh, actually, I will say that there is not much of uh, loss of stereopsis. But uh, the issue was uh, I uh, tried two equipments. One brand, uh, uh, I had quite a lot of uh, diplopia. I was uh, not able to uh, focus well. Uh, mainly when we do chop, the chopper, I was seeing two. Then I called the company person and asked, this is how this system uh, works. Then I tried another uh, demo with another company and I was comfortable with it. There was not much of uh, diplopia. Loss of stereopsis, theoretically it is there. But uh, when you operate, you're not seeing much, sir. I was thinking of upgrading my microscope. I have a 1FR Pro. And the next level microscopes were costing uh, more than 30 lakhs. And this device costs hardly 1.5 to uh, 2 lakhs. What I have is the Aurolabs OmniGlow. And uh, it's been more than one and a half years. Honestly, I've been quite uh, happy with it. I'm happy that I spent 2.5 lakhs and not another 35, sir. You take a demo, sir. No, no, you tell them to put it in your uh, theater. You do three to five cases. Exactly, that's what uh, I also wanted to stress on. You need to have a hands-on experience in your own OT, in your own uh, surgical chair with your patients. See, I believe in something like what uh, they call for the multifocals, the neural adaptation. You need to experience it in your OT at least for two, three sessions and then go for a decision. You can talk to your uh, friends about the financials, but the experience of operating, it comes only for you. Your uh, friend could be an emetrope. His experience will be completely different from when you have a refractive error. So a friend, who, very good a mentor who's 45, his experience will be different from a pre-presbyo. So you need to really experience, never go by, just by the words. You need to have a three sessions, operate. And uh, regarding the stereopsis, once you start using it, definitely you will get adapted to it. Definitely there will be a loss of. So one advantage will come with then another disadvantage. But the neural adaptation will definitely help you in the long run. So all that matters is your experience with that particular. And when you are taking a demo, one uh, suggestion of which I would like to do is never operate uh, one OT with OmniGlow. Compare it without an OmniGlow on the next sitting. So never keep trying it up. Use OmniGlow for three continuous sessions and see how it works. When you keep, it holds good even for your refract, I mean like faker machines also. When you have two machines and try keeping, uh, trying it, you'll never be comfortable with either machines. Use one machine for three sessions continuously, look at your experience and then decide. That's what I would like to suggest. Uh, no, so all I mean, uh, the question is like uh, when you have a depth perception issue, do you want to switch off when you are doing the faker emulsification? No. So I would like to suggest from end to end, you switch on and use it. That's the best part. As I again said, like definitely with your neural adaptation, you'll get used to it. When you keep switching on and off, definitely it is going to be an issue. For example, at a rare instance, if you're going to have a PCR, it is going to be a difficult part for you. So right from end to end, you have to go with it. Thank you, Jayanthan. Any other questions? Because I think, because it's international code, we can make it really interactive to learn from everybody. Because each practice is different and each one's use it for a different purpose. Yeah. So we can all open up so it become a better discussion actually. Uh, to start an OT, which is the best microscope? Yeah. So everybody goes through a journey. So we have also come through that. So what they call by basic, basic is basically in the end of the day, it comes to the cost as far as we are concerned because we are setting up our practice. So choosing among the basic, I think that uh, as already uh, said by the previous speakers, you have to experience it firsthand. Because we can, as I already said, see, Apasami's got, Leica's got, Topcon has got. 
and there are a few takaki hingis there so unless you have a first hand demo and how which one uh, you are comfortable with because within them we cannot compare because ours is a training institute so we have from the basic to the high end microscope so most people when they come they ask us so i say that it's very difficult to compare a basic one to a high end one isn't it it's like comparing a marti 800 to a ferrari isn't it definitely advantages are there so you can't say there are no advantages so you're supposed to compare within the same class so starting off i would always suggest start with the basic microscope because you start doing your practice as it builds and then you go to the intermediate where you have the side code attachment then you can put on your recording systems so that and the optics are also slightly better actually definitely definitely better there will be a difference and then upgrade it further so all so that's how i would suggest so anybody has a different opinion on that can share so to start your practice uh, basically i would recommend to go for uh, better microscope not the higher end ones but the better microscope mainly because of two reasons one your microscope's life is going to be larger so you're going to use it for a longer time uh, fico machine take it from me not more than 7 years if you're not use it the, either the technology will change or you may be uh, looking for a better options so uh, and uh, of course to start your practice you may not even invest in your fico if you are doing a very good uh, small incision cataract surgery you can even implant a uh, uh, premium ios in a small incision cataract surgery so you really need to invest in a very good microscopes and fico machine as you know we are going to use that only for the fico part but right from your uh, uh, incision till you put an iol microscope is going to be come handy for you so microscope is one thing you really need to work on so cost factor again you can uh, think of all the indigenous microscopes get a demo and then uh, you can work on it a uh, few of the microscopes have a few issues like uh, it depends on the place where you are practicing uh, for example if a microscope has got a, a fan which is attached to it to keep the dehumidifier if the place where you are practicing has got a high humidity there will be a little amount of uh, moisture that is getting in and if you are using it infrequently there could be a fungal growth in that so the maintenance of the ma equipment is also something you need to take care so all that comes in that range is not the same so you need to think about the optics you need to think about the attachments that is going to come in it and the maintenance part of it especially pertaining to your own ot setup and your place so that also needs to be taken into account when you are having your cost factor work done because a 6 uh, lakh microscope if it needs lot of maintenance it is going to eat lot of time so better to spend on a few lakhs more and then have a maintenance free microscopes so you need to talk to the company person about that also uh, step wise uh, the question is how do you compare a step wise magnification with a continuous zoom uh, basically i believe like pre press biops the step magnification definitely is good but once you get up uh, once you become a press biop it is always better go for the continuous zoom and continuous zoom has got other advantages when you are going for a recording all the other purposes definitely because uh, recording system is very important i don't recommend high end recording systems but definitely you need to have at least a small indigenous recording system initially to start your practice always audit your own surgeries that's how you improve every day to even if you want to go for a premium uh, cataract practice your surgical steps has to be refined every day for that you need a recording system so see for the compatibility of, of the recording system in your microscopes that is also very important so continuous zoom yes if that's an option if that is inside your pockets the thing definitely go for it step uh, definitely uh, has its own advantage disadvantages because from 0.6 it'll go go to 1 so uh, what i feel is like after 36 you'll be more comfortable using a 0.8 rather than 0.6 or 1 so once you have a higher magnification the field will come definitely will become very smaller and your depth is going to be not that good so always it is better to go for a continuous zoom rather than on a step zoom thank you jantan nick sir i have two nice questions uh, one is in uh, uh, city center and the other one is in peripheral center in city center i am working with a uh, one fr jais one fr it is pretty good no problem with that in the peripheral center i am working with takaji which is old one old microscope because of that its red glow is very poor so in doing ssis i have no problem with, with any microscope but with hako 
uh, as a, we are going to foster capsule near the, to the foster capsule, uh, glow should be there, red glow should be there, which is deficient in Takaji microscope. So should I go for Omni glow or should I purchase a new microscope like a uh, Topon uh, or something like that? Uh, sir, if your Takagi is actually working well, if the illumination is good, uh, if there is no maintenance issues, if the optic is perfectly maintained, you have a tiltable uh, optics, you have an XYZ zoom, don't go for a newer one, sir. It's better to invest on an Omni Glow and then go ahead with this procedure. Uh, because thank that's. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question. Ma okay, so ma'am's question is uh, you, Is it better to buy a second hand, higher end equipment or go for the lower end, newer ones? That's a million dollar question. I think. I think uh, <laughs> with my experience, for starting our practice, go with the new ones. Don't get tempted with the refurbished ones. It's same like cars because you don't know how the other person is used. It is not according to the number of years. It doesn't mean if it is a three-year-old microscope, it's going to be better than a seven-year microscope. As Jensen said, the previous models are all very sturdy. So we still have microscopes which are 10 years old, 15 years old from Hack Street and uh, Lumera Eye in our practice. But the newer ones that are coming don't last that long. So my suggestion as far as equipments are concerned, when you're starting your practice and it's going to be a single equipment investment, it should be only new because as Jayantan said one point, what you buy is going to last for the next five years. But when you buy anything second hand, you will have starting trouble from first year. Then you will have to maintain it. Then you're going to spend changing one one part because one day you will have the light system going. The other day it might be the optical system. So each time you will be more spending time and headache on repairing those things which is not required uh, when you start your practice. So I would always recommend new ones. When you're going for the second microscope, you have become bigger, so you need two OT rooms, you have need two ARs, you need two A scans. That time maybe probably you can think of these refurbished ones. So I would like to accept uh, his answer. Uh, see, basically just remember one part, a person who's going to sell the machine, uh, they'll be selling for the reason of upgradation, uh, like only only one in 10 of the people will be upgrading to a higher end and they'll be selling. If I'm planning to sell it off, it says that it's there's a fault in it. So I'm not happy with it. When I am not happy, then naturally, uh, I had a word from my father. My father was an ophthalmologist. He said like, never give your equipment as a second hand, even free of cost to any of your friends, because that is going to cost your relationship. Because when you're trying to sell it, definitely it is not a new one or it is definitely going to be a fault. The day one you get the machine inside, there couldn't be a big issue. It's, it holds for any electronics. So definitely... Uh, I think Pratibha wants to, to give some highlights. I have a doubt. I'm not, uh, I, I mean, I don't know much about finances, AMC, CMC, I, I feel, I find a lot of uh, uh, youngsters also. So style, I mean, you people can guide us, like uh, what should we exactly see? What should we go about with uh, looking about the AMC charges or CMC charges? Like, can you highlight in microbes, microscopes? See, for microscopes, I think it is usually not needed because nothing usually goes wrong for the first five years at least, except for the bulbs that we have to maintain and a regular service. I think for FACO machines and vitrectomy machines, it's required. Uh, Atik? Just one, uh, uh, one shock that I got uh, I, for uh, uh, servicing my uh, Zeiss microscope, I called Zeiss person to come and uh, do it. That was the first and last time I called them. Just to service it, to clean the optics and uh, to ensure it runs, I was charged 45,000 way higher than uh, my surgeon's fees for about four to five cases. So never do that. There are a lot of people available freelancing who will be able to do a very good job for five to six thousand, maximum five thousand. They will be very happy you pay them five thousand for that half an hour, 45 minutes job. Only thing with microscope, it's fungus issue is one problem. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'm from Chennai. I think Cochin also there will be a lot of humidity related uh, issues. So you close your microscope, fungus is, uh, uh, is an issue. You don't operate for 10, 15 days. During COVID time, we had that issue. I shut down for one month and that was happening. Otherwise, AMC, CMC for microscope, I don't think it is needed. Definitely microscope will last for uh, ages. It, it doesn't uh, uh, go off at all. I don't know about the uh, life of LED, but uh, the previous bulbs, it fuses, you change it, that's it. So AMC, CMC is not needed. I call them once every uh, six to seven months 
I have a date when I have cleaned it. So after six months or so, I do it. Problem is I fitted OmniGlow. So uh, cleaning the lens is not possible without removing that basic device. So it looks a little fragile. It doesn't look solid. And the weight of the equipment has increased. So I ensure they come, they check the screws, tighten it and then go. Otherwise that up, down and X, Y, there is a lot of load because of that extra gadget and the recording system which is uh, attached. So I call them once every six months. And uh, it all depends on how you use uh, saline. Sometimes when the assistant pushes, no, that is where uh, it issues. So I uh, tell them not to put saline. I use only visco. The, uh, cleaning again causes damage in your uh, optics. The way we clean, it causes the coating to peel off. And using alcohol is another issue which I found. We should not use alcohol-based swabs to do the uh, cleaning. It is advisable to just use the blow and uh, clean technique where we don't uh, peel off the coating. So that was a hard lesson that I learned in the previous microscope because of using alcohol-based cleanings very aggressively, the coating peeled off. Uh, maintenance part, definitely there are two things which I want to add. One, definitely don't use an alcohol-based uh, cleaner. Uh, it is better to avoid physically also rubbing it. Always just blow off the dust water is available, one. Second thing is, uh, as I was mentioning, there will be always be a fungal issue with the microscopes uh, because there will be always a fan which keeps cooling the head. So all we need to do is, uh, even if you are infrequently using, for example, like sir said, like if it's a peripheral center, you're going to operate just two days a week. Every day, it is always better, just keep the microscope on. The light should be on. The heat will actually destroy the spores. If it is kept ideal, then definitely. Third thing is if you are using uh, if you are uh, using uh, for the cleaning if you are using any sprays whether it any aldehyde based sprays your microscope head has to be covered because this gets into the microscope uh, the fan of it and uh, that's when it goes off easily so whether it is formula and whatever we are using it is always better clean the microscope uh, exterior cover it and then use the uh, sterilization methods whatever you are doing to, for the theater. My question was with cleaning also. Uh, suppose uh, I sir said that after six months he uh, bring, uh, uh, asked someone uh, expert to clean the lenses. But uh, in the meantime, sometimes after two or the three weeks, if we have to clean the optics, with which solution or chemical we should clean it? Only with that. Oh. And we, should we use tissue paper or uh, any? It's always better to use a lint-free clo cloths, uh, lint lint-free cloth, and it is always better. Most of your uh, gauze we cannot use. Uh, most of the companies, like if you have an optical shop, uh, the SLR, whatever it is, I don't uh, know her financial interest. All these branded, they'll give a cloth which will be of very good quality, uh, Haini, whatever it is. That cloth will be totally lint-free, and that will be scratch-proof also. So it is also important to keep that cloth uh, safe, because if you're keeping the cloth elsewhere, you can, uh, there will be a dust on it and you will be scratching the optics. So the cloth has to be properly maintained. That's why I said SLR because they give it with the, uh, I mean, plastic covers, pouches. You can keep it in the pouches and keep it away. So. Any other questions? Any VR surgeons? Anybody interested in recordings? Any suggestions also from your side for uh, the young ones? About 3D. So I think if there are no other questions, and then we'll come to an end of the session. So just like to thank uh, Dr. Jayanthan for having us here and for doing this course. And thank you all for being here till the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being here on the last day of the session. So it was really an honor to have you all here. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.